Welcome back to Never Fade, the NFT podcast. I'm your host, Bass. Thank you so much for listening in. We've put together quite a few episodes here trying to bring you Web3 Builder Alpha. Plus, you know, we are traders as well. So we would like to get into some of the different NFT projects along the way. So uh, we really appreciate if you do follow us at Never Fade NFT on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube and Good Month Labs has been putting together this production and trying to bring Web3 builders together to the space and and really like understand their journey, you know, because we're kind of on a new frontier here and we kind of pull together and kind of navigate the unknowns of, of the crypto space and Web3 together. You know, we have regulatory concerns looming. We have um, a lot of things that are happening in the NFT space. So we're just trying to kind of distill that and get focused. So I've had the pleasure of working with some bright folks here at Good Month Labs. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to some of them today. Yeah, it's been a journey and I can tell you the culture inside of the Good, Good Month Labs team is something like I've never experienced before. I'm happy to be part of it. So first off, let me kick it over to the founder of Good Month, Good Month ETH, to kind of get us started here. Before we dig into it too much, can you give us a little bit of background on what is Good Month Labs really doing in the space? What are your objectives? And also, if you could touch on Cake App, which is the you know leading product that I understand is going to be dropping here very soon. I think our listeners and other people participating here would benefit from getting this background. Yeah, absolutely. We got some feedback after the Jack Butcher episode that people really wanted to dig into our backgrounds too. So episode one, we go into that uh, for people that want to go back and listen and hear the backgrounds. But just briefly, you know, it's been eight years in cybersecurity. Uh, I was really into uh, the blockchain just based on the native security implications that its infrastructure brought over. So I'd always been tuned into it. Um, and then, you know, with the NFT rise in 2020 to 2021, it just felt like it was finally the time where uh, you could communicate with people around blockchain activities. You know, putting a picture on top of a crypto token really opened up the aperture for people to be able to learn um, a little bit more about it. And, and it's kind of an age old thing if you think about it. You know, when you think of money and you think of the narrative behind money, there's always pictures on dollar bills or pictures on credit cards, things like that, they give some type of branding and symbolization to it. So it, it really makes a lot of sense that NFTs opened up the aperture for, for the uh, adoption funnel. And that's really a lot of my motive of why I started Good Month Labs. It was beginning of 2022. Um, David, who's on this call, uh, David Burning, he heads up our engineering we had been tinkering around for six months prior to that of what we could be building. And we were at the time testing building for consumers. And building for consumers was a lot of fun, but we quickly realized that the game had shifted. Uh, investors and people who put money into businesses are still expecting millions of DAUs every day. Um, and that type of growth promise. But we had known the world's changing. We'd known that the behaviors of spending and consuming were different. And we also knew that this was different when talking about activities and engagement on the blockchain. So we quickly kind of backed up. We thought about where we want to build and we started building for the picks and shovels approach, which is sitting at the level where brands and enterprise can use the blockchain as easy as they use any enterprise or tool within their tech stack. Now, a piece of that in KCAP is deployment. That's deploying NFTs. There's a ton of competitors out there that deploy NFTs for retail, but nobody is out there building for the integration to Web2 and the integrations to brands and enterprise. So uh, we've been at uh, it for over a year now building this platform. And I'd love to hand it over to David Burning here and hear from him a little bit. Um, but I think one thing that ha has really kind of blown my mind is that when you start building something in early 22 in the blockchain space, 
you've likely pivoted by now because the landscape has changed so much. But we took such a big bite, uh, such a big ambitious bite out of what we wanted to build. And we were aiming at a large platform for brands and enterprise that we would eventually be able to fold use cases into. And at the time, when you set out to build that in early 22, nobody understood it. Nobody got it. It was lost on everybody. But then the bear market hit and agencies were still selling Web3. And now we're having conversations in the summer. And then it turns to Q3, end of Q3, beginning of Q4. And people start to understand that it's necessary, that it's needed, that though we're in a bear market, Web3 is not going away. Tools will be needed. They'll need to be backward compatible with Web2. And now we're hitting our flywheel. So it's amazing to kind of call that vision, call that shot, and be relevant without a pivot. I'm proud as hell of the team. Um, and with that said, I'd love to kind of go in uh, to learn a little bit about David's building journey. Because David, when he came into the space and started tinkering out on the blockchain, you know, I, I can't imagine you envisioned we would be where we are today. Can you kind of walk me through a little bit of that, you know, journey of building for 12 months? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as Andrew mentioned, we both started dealing out the space, Andrew much more than myself, um, as, you know, an involved trader of NFTs at the time. And he was sharing his experiences with me, the communities he was becoming a part of. And it felt really electric, really exciting. It felt like it brought a community-centric ethos to tech where before it seemed really dry and very, you know, very void of any sort of life. It seemed like cryptocurrencies and particularly NFTs and the communities that were being drawn to it brought a lot of life into tech. And I love complexity. I love swimming around complexity. I love chewing on really complicated problems for long periods of time and creating value on top of them. So it was a perfect match with Andrew and I. And as the kind of vision grew of what we wanted to do, uh, the time invested and the hard knocks that were having, that were had to have experienced, um, just made it all the more apparent that this was the right, the right direction to go and the right tools to build. Well, yeah, a lot of people on this call don't even know the very first uh, explorations of tinkering that we did. So the very first thing that we built before we were Good Month Labs, David and I together, uh, and by the way, we, we met in college. Um, that's kind of a good story. We might have to save that for another podcast. Love long it. Yes. story Hold short. Hold it to you. Yeah, long story <laughs> short, I, I was a philosophy <laughs> major. He was a business major, finance major. He wound up in a philosophy class as an elective, just bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, stoked to be here. I was in my junior <laughs> year, dark, depressed, and existential crisis, watching this guy come in with a tattered shirt. He actually looks like the apes with the black tattered shirts. Uh, walks in, just so excited. You know, I had my strategy down, sat front row, stared the teacher down straight in the eye, like that's how you don't get called on. He goes in the back rows asking all these questions. I'm like, man, this guy's got the juice. He's way too happy to be talking about these dark topics. Like what, you know, what's he doing here? But um, then, you know, found out we actually, then the elective that I chose was macro econ. And that was his major. So he chose an elective in a high level, a high level course that was my major. I chose an elective in a high level course that was his major. So it was like, whoa, philosophy econ. And it's just, it's ironic that we're, we're on Web3 now because it really is like the renaissance. You, you need philosophy, you need math, you need economics um, to, to navigate this. So it's, it's a crazy origin story. But what we originally started tinkering on was token gated before token gated was a thing. Token gated merch sales for only cheetah apes. So cheetah gang, uh, trait specific merch drops. That was that wow. was it. And this was this was June June of twenty one, and then uh, after that uh, it was the joy. Talk about building for a niche right there. Yeah, and then it was the joy feed because we were trying to distill like how does a community come together in Discord and how to like what is vibes? That was our question. It's about vibes. What is vibes? How do you distill vibes? How can you quantitate vibes? 
And so David was like, I can like see you guys writing that on a whiteboard behind you. (laughs) What is vibes by David and Andrew? (laughs) Yeah. So David was like, I can quantitate vibes. I think I get this. So he goes into Discord and he's like, dude, these gifts are fire. Like, I every like these gifts and memes are fire. And that's how people are communicating. Let's just pull all the gifts out of Discord via the API, look at the sentiment analysis based on how many emojis were thrown. And we can see what the top memes and gifts were. We'll call it the joy feed. And people can just hit like roll a mint from the joy feed from the bake discord or the pixel vault discord. Um, so we went on that a little bit and tinkered there. And then like my wife hit me with like, it was November 21. And she's just like, hey, this up only euphoria things kind of cool and all. But like, you need to figure things out because... These Discord pings are like dis- disrupting my sleep. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll figure that out. And then so we built GMGN.me, which just took the cream of the crop of Discord announcements and just funneled all the announcements to an email digest. And I, we launched that and got like a thousand subscribers in like two days. So it was, uh, it was pretty wild. Like all these little, these little like, uh, hack projects to kind of get our bearings and feel sentiment was how it started um yeah and it all started with the uh study of memeology you know and, and so david the head of engineering and good month labs he's been the man behind the scenes behind the screen <laughs> but look at this guy we got to get him on camera more often yeah i mean his his ETH name, you know, his his ETH name is OX Fox. It was like OX Pretty Boy or OX Fox. So, uh, you know. <laughs> but one of the uh, one of the fascinating things also about David um, as an engineer and a builder is, yeah, I've worked with a lot of engineer teams. I've worked with a lot of pro engineers uh, and architects, but David. He, David's definitely one of the top. And the reason being is because his thought process, his ability to think not linearly, um, but uh, in a matrixy uh, when it comes to building is phenomenal. And, and I mean, you can attribute it to the fact that he was a finance major. He took philosophy on as, as, a, as a hobby. And, and now uh, he's building as an engineer. And it really it's remarkable to watch it come to life because he can navigate designs and think about designs and think about end user journeys and also think about how it can be future-proofed with tech uh, moving two to three years out and how we can build on top of it. It's, it's a very rare, um, it's a very rare skill set to have and it's an honor to be able to work with. Uh, honestly, I think it's, it's, it's really one of our, like national treasure uh, skill sets of, of the business. Uh, but David, I think on that on that topic, um, I'd like to hear a little bit about how you think about the blockchain uh, evolving from an engineering perspective and making it as powerful to people who may not know its powers yet. That's a great question. I think at a high level, I think we're going to start seeing just more generally general acceptance of blockchain technology, not at its low level technological details, but at just a high level service oriented perspective. You know, an example being when email came out, people were talking about it at the SMTP layer and all the technical details around how electronic emails are being sent and delivered. But over time, email became its own abstracted word and service, and people thought of email more by the service providers and the ease of use, as opposed to the low-level you know, technical implementation requirements. I see that. So you know, I, I don't anticipate being asked as much in the future, what is a blockchain when we're talking about Web3 and Web3 services? Yeah. I more yeah. anticipate what are... What services are we going to be talking about, essentially, and what value is being created from those services? So I see that it's going to be a general, it's going to be generally accepted by the culture. The market's proven to be a value-added service in society. 
It's a brilliant point because this is the Never Fade podcast. And if you think about it, right, what can you not fade on the protocol levels? TCIP protocol. That's that's how we connect to the internet. It's it you can't fade it. SMTP protocol email gets used to date every day, right? Can't fade it. SMS protocol text message not going away. It's unfadeable. But yet here we are. We I, I, you know I wouldn't be surprised if half the people listening haven't heard of one of those protocols. It's abstracted, and yet. Here we are in the blockchain world talking ETH and Solana, L1s, L2s. All, you know, it's like it, it's going to be abstracted. It's going to be understood. And Fax had a killer take on the last podcast. Something that he took away from somebody was talking about gaming. You know, Web3 gaming is what Fax was referring it to. And someone said it's not going to be Web3 gaming. It's just going to be gaming. It's just, you know... You know, for all my rap f- rap fans out there, like ain't nothing changed but the address, you know? So that, you know, that's kind of that's kind of the take there is like we're going to operate the same. It's just going to have different use cases on those protocols. So I think that's a, you know, I think that's a killer take. David, it was great to hear from you. You've been building through the bear and we're really happy to have you on the team. I'm, I've been watching you execute behind the scenes. And, you know, good month, he, he can sit here and act all, you know, ni- nice guy on, on the pod, but we know he has high expectations. And frankly, you've been meeting and exceeding those expectations from the jump. So just one more question for you before we let you go. You know, when you think about kind of building through the bear and where we are now, and maybe like a little bit of sun is, is shining through those clouds, the team is out there, they're, you know, bringing in potential new brands and, as this gains traction, the pressure on your team and the engineering team is going to uh, continue to increase. You know, how do you approach the demands of scaling uh, with your team? I think, at a values perspective, really, like the people we bring on our team and <clears throat> the kind of work that we, well, the kind of values we embody as we take on the challenges that are presented to us. Like we really, we really live the values that we preach around excellence, around, you know, a user first perspective of what we're building and who we're building for. And just a general curiosity of the space itself. There's a lot of things that we get handed that we don't know all the details immediately, but we're curious enough to go learn and understand what we what we need to know in order to build the things that are being asked of us. So I'd say those those three things, it's having a a sense of or a level of excellence that we want to bring to the work, a high level of care for the people that are going to be using these tools, both from a brand's perspective and from, you know, a, a token holder's perspective, because they are transacting real money for the tokens that we're minting or that we're creating for them. And the value that's exchanged between them and brands, it's a real value transfer. And then lastly, just a overall curiosity to keep us hungry to know more and how to create more value uh, with these digital products. I think those three things are what we preach. Those are what we look for in people that are eager to come and join the team. And those are things that we need to live every day so that we don't we don't lose sight of our goal and we don't we don't fade, I guess, on on the products that we promise clients. Yeah, and another thing, facts that like I think we're really we're really good at and we're really focused on is you know not to pull from you know the D gods and the D lay, uh, but it's D scope. You know, if we had a word that keeps us strong and efficient, it's D scope. Like ideas come in every single day, and people come in and ask for the shiny toy every single day, and our job is to derobe that shiny toy like de-scope that thing to the bare fundamentals so that it can be agnostic and it can scale across customers. I think that's one of the things. Um, I want to keep this real. I want to make this, I want to keep this podcast real because we, we put people in the, in the no fade zone on this podcast and we specifically make bets on people to be around for two to three years. So um, the only way you know, we can keep things real here as being authentic ourselves. And David, I want to shoot you a question. 
um, three years from now to keep us running a hundred like we're running today? What are what are two things that I need to do differently to scale three years from today? Oh man, it's a great question. I don't think it's doing anything differently. I think it's refining what's already being done. And we're all learning in real time as we take on more and more roles and responsibilities as we scale as a business. So I would say the one thing that comes to mind is just being cognizant of where time and attention perhaps is being misallocated wherever the function is. You know, like if you feel, if any one of us feels we're leaning too far on one side and we haven't given enough thought and attention to this other thing on the other side, then we should have a real good, we should have a real good monitor of where we need to back up and refocus into. And that's always changing. So, I mean, on your end, you're dealing with so many different verticals from, you know, finance, operations, design, product, engineering even. And to be invested in all all of those different functions, you know, there's a time when maybe one is feeling neglected and just having a really good pulse of what that is. And like you are always, you know, open to being told like, hey, I think you need to put more time over here. Like, I think that's going to be the trick for all of us to master as we continue along. Totally. Love it. That's the eject button, folks. That's what he said. <laughs> he's saying, he said, you know, clear the desk, clear the desk, <laughs> clear the desk. Make sure you see the eject button because when you need to hit it, wow, baby, you can't be fumbling. You can't be fumbling the bag. You can't be sifting through the papers to try to find the eject button. You got to hit that eject button on that vertical and replace yourself in that vertical. That's that, or not in that vertical, in that department. You got to, boom, shout. <laughs> Love it. I, you know, I think what I think what we need to do good is we need to uh, we need to put Dave we need to put David in the no fade zone over here on the podcast today, right? I mean, am I right? He's in the, he's in the no he's in the no fade zone one hundred percent because I think I think you uh, you show me someone who can build like he builds and can understand like mimetic theory and actually scrub circles around you around like mimetic theory and mimetic representation and deep dive on you. I mean, put put David and Jack Butcher on a call together and then just let them bang, bang, you know? I was getting, I was nerding out because I was checking out Jack's library behind him because he had a really good shot of what he was reading. And I looked at mine, I was like, Damn, we have the same books. Anti Fragile. He's got all the Nicholas Nassim Taleb books, Black Swan. He had a couple others in there that I was noting. Oh, he had Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman. I'm like, all right, I see this guy. See, that's then that's that's David right there. That's David. He's listening to a podcast. Most people are listening audio or whatever. He's zooming in on the YouTube <laughs> to try to gather the alpha of the books behind him. <laughs> that. That 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 symbolizes Good Month Labs. So if you've been following the Never Fade podcast, then you may be familiar with Mitch Morales. Mitch is our head of business development and operations at Good Month Labs, also our resident check expert. And he's been on the pod a few times and it's really been a pleasure working with Mitch. And I'd love to hear some takes from Mitch in terms of when you're communicating with potential clients or brands that are different uh, than, than things you've experienced in, in web two or in your past career. Yeah. One of the biggest differences, um, in working in web three and trying to kind of sell, um, a product in the space is just the amount of education that has to, to go on. A lot of companies are interested in it. They know that web three is like a big buzzword and they want to have a plan, but they're not really sure where to start. And so. Um, education has been really huge in terms of helping them understand uh, really what's possible in the space and trying to figure out what key initiatives they're looking to uh, to solve for in 2023 and beyond. Um, so that's kind of the I think that's the the biggest like hurdle is just early stage, you know, helping people figure out what they actually want to do, um, and then trying to position a product 
uh, to kind of speak to that, to that issue. Yeah. It's almost like before you can get to like some, some more core business discussions, it's almost like you have to explain what it is that even is happening around them some of the time. Um, what's like one of the most, I, I would say, negative experiences or responses that you've had from an investor uh, in terms of like their take on what's going on in Web3 and crypto and and uh, specifically with what you're trying to explain to us? Sure. Yeah. I think like the, I remember one of the most difficult questions to, to answer initially was well, why do brands need to be on chain? Um, why can't they just continue to do uh, things like they've always done? And um, it really kind of forced us to go back to first principles and sort of rethink why we're in the space. Um, we're trying to affect change. We're trying to, uh, you know, create a, a better world, both in the digital front and, um, and IRL. And, and I think that's ultimately what a lot of the spirit of crypto and web three is meant to do. Um, you know, a lot of the digital native generations from young millennials or older millennials to Gen Z have grown up with different ideas about identity and ownership and, um, marketers understand that they're who they're mark, who they're trying to attract as customers and community is changing. And, um, a lot of the principles that have been built around web three are, are really those that, that, um, vibe with, with, uh, the newer customers in, in brands, um, you know, in their target market. So I think that's, that's kind of the, the big thing is kind of just being like, why, why should I, like, why should I do this? And being able to answer those questions is, is I think helped us in terms of being able to better articulate like where we want Kate to be positioned in the market. I think, I think one thing that's, that's really interesting aside from Mitch reporting live from ETH Denver, AKA the psych ward, cause that kid is going nutty in the bat and the BG. Um, I think, I think one of the, uh, I think one of the really interesting things about Mitch is when we first started working together, it was apparent. I mean, we knew coming in, I knew coming in that like Mitch knows how to build businesses and scale them and, and, and take them from zero to one like mad. But one of the interesting things is when we first started working together, Mitch was, Mitch was really throwing, you know, a lot of knives at the, at the, at the value prop, at the business model. Um, he beat it up in every which way. And I think, you know, we went through like three to four months of just the gauntlet of, of question question asking object objection handling just internally um to battle test us to go externally and i think there were a lot of moments um in that quarter in that quarter you know three to four months where you know we had some burn down moments like we had some we had some times where we asked the questions like do we burn it all down right now and and pivot in a different direction. Do we, if we were to start all over right now, where would we go? And we really like distilled a lot of conviction out of those conversations. So one thing that I'd like to kind of hear from Mitch is what was your, what was your moment you think where you decided to, you know, where you, where you kind of got full conviction on not just the space we're building in, but the vertical we're building toward and the uh, approach we were taking to that vertical. Yeah, I think I've um, kind of told this story before, like, uh, you know, kind of the, the sort of aha moment um, with Web3. Um, you know, I, I, I totally like understood um, why crypto is important uh, early on, but I didn't really see some of the like real world or like bridge between digital and real world use cases. Um, and without those, it was hard to kind of really get in and know like where to start building. Um, and then when the pandemic hit and I was kind of involved in like the entertainment and experiential industry and investing in that space, um, 
a lot of founders and portfolio companies that we had were pivoting, you know, what NFT strategy, metaverse, tokenization of greater economies, things like that. And and that's kind of where I really started to see like the opportunity to, to get some product market fit um, and seeing people achieve that, like really kind of led me to, to try to have my wheels start turning and figure out like where I would want to, to kind of start in this space. Um, and when I met uh, Andrew last summer, um, that's where I think we really kind of vibed on the idea that, you know, quote unquote, next billion users, that kind of meme of like, everybody's trying to like, you know, increase adoption. I think there's a few other spaces that we're going to see it in the next big bull run, you know, gaming and social. Um, but uh, brands bringing legacy IP and communities um, into the space is is one where I thought like, you know, there could be some, there's some really interesting business models um, that have, that have uh, carried the, the tech space over the last couple of decades, uh, B2B, Enterprise SaaS um, is one and trying to figure out how to fit that into this open source uh, world uh, was, was, you know, really that problem, like, like good month um, alluded to uh, and, and why we, we spent a long time in trying to figure out what that approach would be. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's really like where we're, we're super excited to, to help, um, brands make their first foray into web three, the way that I like to explain it, the way that I'm pitching it, uh, in real time here, here at ETH Denver, um, we help brands on board into web three. And, and, the, the example is like what Squarespace did initially for brick and mortar businesses, just helping them get that, that first website that eventually became their, their e-commerce hub. Um, cake wants to do that for, for brands, um, allowing them to launch a DAP where they can deploy a token and they can also kind of control that ecosystem that, uh, that, that token unlocks. So, uh, loyalty, uh, programs, rewards, token gated content and, and features, product releases, um, both hybrid and, and, uh, and physical products as well that are, uh, kind of controlled by that, that token that, that governs the community. Um, that's where we kind of see the first like real opportunity for brands to be able to wrap their heads around it and then be able to have that that product that um you know we can continue to build features around and, and really build out a, a an incredible uh suite that can tap and tie into a lot of the other tech stack that that's existing in, in medium to, to larger uh organizations yeah for sure do you, you know one thing i kind of think about a lot is the the how long the question mark's going to be until the use cases become ubiquitous. And I think we, we see this a lot with, um, or we've seen this in the past with something like, you know, small to medium, this or <clears throat> small to medium businesses with Facebook, where everyone was kind of running towards Facebook and telling everybody they need a Facebook. And people were just kind of swirling around this question mark, mark, like, do I really, when will I need to do that? And now it's just like small, medium businesses have Facebooks and Instagrams and all those things. Like, have you spent some time thinking about the question mark gap, the chasm that we have to cross for brands and how long it's going to take for that that uh, question to be answered? Yeah, I, I think the the time is like, you know, 2023, we're going to look back and it's going to be the, the year of the brand, the the year where you could have these kind of um, external, like kind of centralized incentive uh, providers that are willing to to kind of make the spend and and kind of stand up their first experimental um, drops into you know NFT, an NFT project or some other type of like Web three activation. Um, you know the the larger brands are probably um like a nike right is is able to build their own platform uh, and so they're people are looking to them and saying okay like these people get it they're you know they're innovators and, and ahead of the curve we need to be we need to also have a web3 strategy um so yeah i think 
I think it's happening now. And I think, I think, you know, the world we're living in, everything moves a lot faster, um, than, than we kind of expect. So yeah, we're, we feel like we're super well positioned and we feel like we're positioned a little bit differently than, um, a lot of the other tools that are similar in the space. They're either, they're either specifically curating to like, you know, creators or they're very, um, the offering is like very finite, uh, you know, no code NFT deployments. Like, yes, that's part of our plan, but a lot of the features that we're, that we're building are meant to hook deeper into the, into the enterprise. Um, and I think that, that kind of like lowering of friction on the web two side is, is what is going to be really helpful for, for adoption. It's getting people that are used to seeing the reporting and the kind of like permissions and those type of features in their tools when they're when they start seeing those that's when they they can actually kind of buy in a little bit further and and feel like they can lean on those tools versus like yeah just kind of use it as a as a nice to have mitch i think something interesting that we've seen is a lot of interest from marketing agencies and i think where we're uniquely positioned is this relationship between those agencies and then these incredible digital communities that we see in the space. Um, can you talk about what you've seen as far as kind of harnessing that energy um, and really kind of amplifying outcomes for these agencies? Yeah, I think that's the real trick, right? Like a lot of the notable NFT collections have been built almost completely um, mod chain communities. And um, a lot of the like, you know, traditional companies have seen you know kind of medium to like very little success in, in doing more than just activating their existing communities and bringing them um you know to set up a wallet or or, or do these first few web reactions for the first time um, we like working with agencies um, especially those that like have a really solid handle on uh the brands uh all, all of the brands plans and we, we like to like kind of slot in and help them navigate the space make sure that they're um you know, they're using, uh, you know, not exposing the, the brand to like a lot of, of, of risk, uh, making sure that the, uh, that the, you know, the contracts are all set up properly. And then also that they're communicating in a way that, that attracts, that it makes it easy for their existing community to come on and, you know, mill with a credit card or not have to custody their own, um, their own assets. Uh, at the same time, being able to kind of speak and welcome um, that the web three natives over and, and, you know, allow them to get some, uh, you know, speculate on, on some of this, these new collections that are launching that have, you know, additional economic energy behind them from, from web two and, and legacy world. Mitch, the space is moving so fast and, you know, you're on the grind every day. And so I imagine just over the past few months, few months, you've probably learned quite a bit. Uh, what's something that, if you could tell yourself three months ago, you would have told yourself. No, so I, I, I think I think something that um, I would tell myself now is is, um, and it's not really just relevant to this space, but kind of kind of getting back to to really like building and you know like pitching on you know doing sales demos and investor pitches like back to back on the same day it's it's um it's really just like try that trying to slow down um and and really focus and not kind of uh you know mass market and and have like a very like like generic approach to things i think at the end of the day people still need to um understand and like the kind of the why in all of this and i think that's a very like custom answer for everyone um and when i've started doing that and really just like like double clicking in to to help people on their journey um that's where like people kind of open up have their own aha moments and and we start to get a lot more traction um with with folks so yeah just it's it you know and, I, and that's what i would say for anybody that's trying to trying to build in the space like 
it's, it can be very overwhelming. Like there's, there's information coming you at all times. There's, there's new NFT collections dropping that you're trying to like participate in. You're trying to watch the, the prices of, of, of what you're holding. All of this is happening in the background of, of trying to run a business. And so, um, uh, really like just trying to slow down and, and, and focus on, on what's right in front of you and, and tune out some of that noise is I think when, when you can do that, um, things start to start to get simplified and it starts to get more fun. That sounds like business alpha to me, Mitch. Thanks so much. Uh, we know you're at ETH Denver, so we wish you the best and we know you're going to be very busy out there. Stay safe. Have a great trip. Thanks for joining us. All right. So without further ado, last but definitely not least, the other person who absolutely cannot fade at Good Month Labs, Chief of Staff, Corinne Carver. Corinne, thank you so much for joining us. If you give us a little bit of uh, background about yourself and kind of how the experience has been going so far here. Yeah, totally. Thanks for having me. Um, this is great. I've been listening to the pod since episode one, just absolutely fell in love from the first episode. Um, got some really good pieces of alpha just from that first one and knew I was going to be hooked. So main subscriber right here. Um, my background, I spent about 10 years um, with Startup Accelerator. So started back in 2014 with an incubator called SeedSpot. Um, and this is back when people didn't know what incubators and accelerators were, right? They're like, oh, incubators. So you work with babies. Cool. Awesome. Um, what was great about um, getting into that space so early is that we worked with idea stage startups and a lot of them in the social impact space. So really, I was constantly surrounded by expert entrepreneurs. Um, these were people who were just seeing problems in their lives and taking them into their own hands by starting a business. So I worked with that organization for almost a decade, um, and really, as I was looking to transition, I just always wanted to be surrounded by people who were experts in their industry. And so, Bax, I mean, you get to talk to Andrew all the time. You know, he's an expert, just like you. And then you hear David talk, too, and you're just inspired by these incredible experts. So um, when the team was looking to bring someone on to support operations, to support marketing, kind of be a shape shifter and, and fill the gaps where need be. Um, Andrew and I had been in conversation and I was um, stoked enough to really connect and just understand the mission of what the team was trying to take on um, and was overjoyed when I was able to hop on board, get to spend the day with you guys. <laughs> yeah, they, they say that if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're probably in the wrong room. And ever since I've been in the in the room with with you all, I'm Definitely never the smartest. I'll tell you what, we got some sharp minds on the team. And um, just in general, Corinne, you know, when you think about kind of like your work here in Web3, what are some of the challenges so far kind of like in this ecosystem as opposed to your previous experiences? The learning curve has definitely been steep. I think the beauty of my onboarding is that I've been able to immerse myself in my own digital communities, hooking myself up with my own NFTs, and really just exploring the culture from the inside out, um, understanding really you know, what the basis and the ethos behind why people would interact with a community in this way or why people would interact with the blockchain in this way, um, and then really kind of creating that empathy for our users has literally been like my real life too. So um, being able to be on calls with Mitch and Andrew, I mean, multiple times a day. And then I'm over here like asking chat GPT, hey, chat GPT, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I'm like, oh yeah, guys, totally. I got it. Um, but really coming from more of a traditional business accelerator background and then hopping into taking my own medicine um, and building this startup and bringing my expertise in operations and scaling and supporting these amazing builders um, has been the best challenge. And I am having so much fun. Um, there's not a day or meeting goes by that I don't pick up a one-liner that I can use for our content that somebody says. There's not a day that goes by where I'm not exposed to a new artist who's doing some incredible, impactful work. Um, and you can't you can't knock it. You know, you, this is, this is where I'm supposed to be for sure. Yeah, you're right. It's definitely like a very stimulating experience. Right. And I think that it's, it's super interesting for, for people who like, like myself, right. Where, you know, 
my day to day up to this point ha had become a little bit stale. And that was kind of like the the draw of, of NFTs and Web3. It's like so new. It's so nascent. There's a certain energy um, that comes with that. And so, you know, with with your background, you know, what kind of advice uh, would you give to people who are building companies or startups as to like, you know, how do you keep on going towards the mission when, you know, in early stages of businesses, you know, it, it, it can sometimes be like a little bit like a huge hill in front of you to climb, you know, like, like what would you, what kind of advice would you give to builders? Totally. I mean, it's, to be a founder, to be a builder, to be someone at the early stages of anything can be really isolating, right? And then you hear somebody, you know, you introduce your idea, your baby to somebody and they're like, oh yeah, I've heard so-and-so is doing the same thing. At the end of the day, the advice I always, always give founders is your idea is not what's unique. You and the way that you execute are what's unique. I think about that all the time here at Good Month Labs. You know, this team um, and this unique spot that we're in and the way that we're taking on challenges, nobody else is doing that. And that's what makes us special. Um, and we're going to make it. That's what's going to make it for us, for sure. Um, and I think yeah, like... definitely wag me. But, yeah, wag me for sure, for sure. I think it's also really cool, like um, being a woman in this space. I mean, I've been so inspired by the women builders, the women investors, the women developers. Um, just folks kind of forging that path and really creating these inclusive communities um, amongst a lot of the work that's being done. And it's just, it, it's really powerful. Um, and I'm honored to be be a part of that community as well. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. So as as we kind of look at the rest of 2023 here, we have Cake App launching soon. Um, Good Month Labs is definitely picking up steam, getting traction. We're getting a lot of these like aha moments from some of the brands we're working with. You know, what is what is like a top goal that you have personally in your role here at Good Muck Labs for this year? My intention um, with working with our product and our organization is to make Web3 accessible to everybody, right? We always talk about how we want to onboard the next X number of users, whatever that may be. The tools that we're building make it so easy for entrepreneurs, for small to medium to, of course, large and enterprise businesses um, to launch on the blockchain, to bring their existing customers, to find new customers. And when we think about, you know, creating equity across business, like this is how we can support these entrepreneurs in getting their products out there and reaching new customers. So for me personally, it's to truly empower um, builders and entrepreneurs to get these tools in their own hands and learn how to use them. Um, and it's so incredibly simple to be able to use these tools. Um, and it doesn't have to disrupt their day to day and can have outsized impact um, in what they're trying to do. So my goal is to just continue to make that access even easier for people to get. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. You know, with that, I think that really wraps up kind of our our Good Month Labs team episode here. We're really excited about what's to come in 2023. Uh, we've what we didn't talk about, which I think is very notable as well, is is the design, right? Like what's being produced. It also is being packaged in a way that is beautiful and. You know, it's 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 artistic, you know, so it's like this kind of intersection of what we can do for brands to make it easy for them and also the expertise of the engineering. And then it kind of like intersects with the design. And I think that's why Cake App is positioned uh, for success here. And and of course, you know, this this great team, bright minds and fantastic leadership. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Corinne and David. Thank you, Mitch Morales and, and Andrew here for putting this all together for us. And with that, um, that wraps up this episode of Never Fade, the NFT podcast. Follow us at Never Fade NFT on Twitter. 
subscribe on YouTube. Thanks for joining us. We're looking forward to bringing more builders from Web3 into the podcast so we can share their trials and tribulations and deliver some alpha along the way. Thank you. That's a bad bet if the bags check less. About to burn back to back, flipping that G when that Jenny Duh hits. That's the race to one, 250 in the world, and you chose to sleep. That's a bad bet if you wake up check less. No more people without bags, but they need status. Running head first with the VV check thirst. Never heard of a hearse, but they can.